stuff I could do. Has this all been informative and interesting? All right, yeah, I know. This has been a great faculty. It's such a, such a, uh, such a come down to listen to me. Um, so I am going to talk a little bit about clinical trials. The only problem is there isn't a whole lot to talk about when it comes to you guys specifically. Um, you know, we'll talk, you've seen, you know, the goal is to get from my slide to his slides, essentially, right? To go from the trials and the testing and stuff like that to actually being implemented. So we've now carried, uh, you know, Affinitor over the, the goal line for lung patients. We've carried now Gallium over the goal line for all neuro patients, which is great. But there's still a whole lot of work to be done. And I think a lot of uh, things that we still need to do is just recognition of, of lung as a kind of a special entity. So I'll talk a little bit about a little bit about clinical trials, just generically, and uh, you know why it's important for you and me to be involved with them, uh, and then we can talk a little bit about what the what trials are available. It's just they're not there aren't that many of them essentially. Okay, so let's talk about clinical trials. So what is a clinical trial? Let's not forget, clinical trial is human research, right? So you know you will hear on the nightly news, oh, science has discovered this new cure for cancer, right? And that study is always in mice, right? The problem is mice have really bad health insurance, really bad health insurance. So, you know, the reimbursement is pretty poor. Uh, you thought Humana was bad, let me tell you now. <laughs> but it's human, it's human research, that's what it is. Just kidding, just kidding. For anyone who is Humana, it's okay, I still take it, don't worry. Uh, but really the purpose is to test something, right? So when, you, when they show you those Kaplan-Meier curves in their survival, they're testing it to find out why. Because we used to give, you know, ground up pork uh, testicles to people to stimulate virility, right? And you know, you would give it, and then they would someone would say, "Oh, look, look how much stronger, you know, Mr. Jones is, or whatever." And then they didn't tell you about the fact that it also caused abscesses, and he died from it, right? I mean, this is what this is the goal. That's why the FDA was created. So we do these very, very complicated uh, and very expensive uh, uh, big pharmaceutical trials because we want to make sure that one that it's safe. And two, that it's something that's effective and will help people instead of just being, you know, out there as you know to, to know what's real and what's not. And that's why you can see it's so rigorous to do these studies and why it's so hard and why it's so long. I mean, in fact, we're really very fortunate that gallium was improved in a in a it was approved really in about five years. Uh, and that sounds like a long time, but it was actually just super quick in FDA terms. Uh, at least we have this new tool. But the goal is to test something new. So, is it a new test? A new blood test? Is it a new procedure, some kind of new de device or something? Is it a new medication, like we've heard about? Is it even a new protocol? You know, do we put, you know, uh, one drug with another drug, or follow it with another drug, or put this drug with that, like Dr. Ober presented? Do you put passeriotide with Affinitor? Can you get some enhanced effect there? So that's what we're that's what we're trying to do. And then another type of trial is just trying to gather information. Right? So we talk about, oh, it's important to be aware, it's important to understand, it's important to get the word out, but, but at the same time, we need to understand your disease, right? So Dr. Oberg has been looking at you guys for the past 30 years, right? I've been looking at you guys for the past six years, and I've learned a whole heck of a lot in those six years just by carefully observing patients. But at the same time, if we could gather more information and, and learn from you all and, 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 and see how your disease behaves, that's also extremely important for um, the, the generations to come of neuroendocrine, because this is only gonna get worse. And then of course the big hot topic now is genetics, right? So one of the questions was about genetics and we're very fortunate that in general, it's not kind of a thing you pass on to your kids, except when you do pass it on to your kids. And so that would be something really important to know. Um, the tests we have right now, just so you know, um, they're, they're little small flashlight beams that, that shine on little bits of your genetics. And so uh, you can't always rely on those tests to really figure things out. I mean, I have. Uh, several patients in which they've had siblings or, or whatever have it, and then their and the end test always comes back negative. And all of this means is that the test was inadequate for that particular person. So we need to do more. But at the same time, with all the genetic testing that we're doing now, sometimes you have information overload, and then I don't know what to do with all that information. So obviously, those kinds of clinical trials that can help us understand that are extremely, extremely important. Not pivotal, really. Okay, so what are the goals of a clinical trial? So just understand this. And we talk, you obviously have been hinted on this already. But basically, I wanna know about safety. Okay, that's extremely, extremely important because there have been, and we've read these before, there have been drugs that have been given to people, normal healthy volunteers who have, who have died, 
right, or have been put in the ICU or something awful happened to them. So we have to make sure that this is safe. And uh, the pharmaceutical companies are well versed now in this process, and so they're very, very careful. And they work with specialized people who can do this, uh, this experiment uh, very carefully. So Dr. Ober would be one, right, so he's doing his oncolytic virus. We have a unit upstairs from us on in, in, in our Midtown office where they do all these phase one trials. And so they're ramping up the dose, they watch them very carefully, they're very um, observant about what, can, what could possibly go wrong with the drug. So safety is number one. Number two is gonna be safety again, right? Because the goal is to not harm you. And safety is number three. So whenever we do these clinical trials, we've gotta make sure. Um, even sometimes when you do clinical trials, even somewhat large clinical trials, you may do 100 or 200 patients and, think, and get your FDA approval. The companies will continue to follow the patients afterwards, right? We've seen some of these drugs come off the market because they've had post-marketing effects. So the, the companies, the FDA watches it carefully, the companies watch it very carefully, and over the past, you know, five or ten years, the companies been even more companies have been even more rigorous about following patients afterwards to see if there's any safety issues. Uh, I know for sure even even when, you know, for example, Novartis, they're here. When they, um, when they have uh, uh, presentations about how to give the drug, they always say, if there's some problem, please call us, please call the FDA, you know, let us know. They want to know if there are any issues happening. Okay, and then the next thing you want to know is, well, what is the dose of the drug, right? So, so you know, we're fortunate that maybe this oncolytic virus will work at a very low dose, but you don't know. Sometimes, you know, traditionally the oncologists, they like to give as much as you can possibly tolerate, right? And that's not easy sometimes, but that's at least a, a starting point. So, you know, we give, uh, for example, we give the uh, Affinitor, for example, is given at 10 milligrams, but some people can only tolerate 7.5 or 5. Um, but they pushed it as high as they possibly could to find the right dose, and then you can tinker with it from there. So where do you, e how much do you even give? Does the, wor does the drug work in your disease of interest, right? So maybe, um, you know, aspirin works really well for your headache, but does it really work for your diarrhea? I don't, don't take aspirin for your diarrhea, by the way, I'm just saying. But, but that's the question, right? So now, sure, so, so I'm gonna keep picking on Affinitor. So Affinitor has been used for, say, um, kidney cancer, right, kidney cancer, and it's been proven to be very effective. Well, just because it works for kidney cancer, it doesn't mean it's gonna work for pancreatic or endocrine tumors, so prove it to me, right? So this is where they started to, to prove this. And this is very important, because if they can prove it, then they can go out and say, look, this has been demonstrated in, in big clinical trials to have efficacy, so it's important for patients to know that it works because for all I know, I, I know eucalyptus leaves might work to cure uh, neuroendocrine tumors. Please don't take your eucalyptus leaves. But I don't know that until someone tests it, until someone rigorously figures this out. So this, these are the things that are really important. In fact, the more classic example is um, the somatostatin analog. So the somatostatin analog like sanostatin, which has been around helping people, many of you in the room for you know, a quarter of a century now, um, certainly as long as we've been, you know, seeing Mrs. Clinton around. And um, it's it really nice because we we have a lot of experience with it. We know it's very safe. We know it's very effective for, um, you know, symptoms and things like that. But even uh, in Dr. Ober's experience, he said, well, it looks like it even has some tumor control too, right? So we say, okay, we're the experts. I learned from the experts, so I start to give it. Looks great, looks wonderful. But then, you know, maybe your own oncologist at home doesn't quite uh, believe it or have experience or whatever you want to call it. And so they, they don't do it for you at home. It's, you know, you have to fly all the way here to get the shot. Or maybe they won't continue your shot at home. Or your insurance company won't cover it. I mean, you can see how it gets more and more complicated. But then, um, you know, an, another company called Ipsen came out with a big trial looking at specifically tumor control. And now it's been approved, and so now both the use of, of sanostatin and somatulin have been used for tumor control. I mean, you know, the, I, they're cringing over there as I say this, but that's what's happening. So does it work for your disease of interest, right? Is it better than the standard of care? There is no question that people who um, were taking a whole bunch of uh, Imodium and Lomodal for their diarrhea and their carcinoid didn't really get the, weren't really that strong. Um, it weren't really that well. But then when they started taking octreotide and sandostatin, they got much, much, much better. So then they, so um, sandostatin was approved for the uh, treatment of diarrhea and uh, carcinoid syndrome. So they proved that and now it's widely used. So you can see, and this is 25 years now, we've had this wonderful drug. And then how does the test, the medication procedure work in humans most importantly? 
because like I said before, you'll hear all these things about cell cultures, you'll hear these things about mice, you may even hear these things in, you know, even larger dogs or monkeys or something, but they're just, it's, you know, a human is just a different kind of a beast, and so you have to prove that it really works in us. Okay, so how, what are the stages of a clinical trial? So you, someone has an idea, right? Either it comes from an investigator or it comes from industry. They do some preclinical trials to get a sense of whether it works, and that will be either in the, in, in, in the Petri dish or in, in some animal work. And then they'll send a whole bunch of documentation to the FDA. And then once they get approval, they'll get something called an IND, which is uh, the ability to investigate this new drug, so an investigational new drug application. And then it goes through the, um, the center's uh, instit institutional review board to make sure it's safe and to make sure that it's, uh, the patient is well, um, well educated. And they go through these phases. Phase one is a safety and a dose finding kind of thing. Phase two is a little bit more disease specific. And phase three is really a comparison for efficacy. So when you hear about that, you know, you see like one graph that Dr. Ober or Dr. Ramirez shows up, that is like a decade and a half and probably millions of human hours of work to get just that one picture. So it is a lot of effort and, uh, and very, very expensive to make that happen. And then phase four is aftermarket. So, you know, if you're taking your medication, you have new side effects that they didn't see. You know, if a million people start taking the drug versus a hundred people, you may see something different. We certainly saw that with some of our diabetic drugs, um, but that's the kind of thing that happens. So now the question is, well, why should I participate? Well, why should you participate? I participate in it because I want to. I want to test new opportunities for you guys, new treatments for you. All right, but why should you participate? Well, sometimes you have no choice, right? You're really sick. You've exhausted all your standard treatments, and that's it. So then we have to put you on trial and see if that happens. If, if you can derive any benefit from it. So this is, in that sense, um, like Dr. Ramirez says, then you're not a guinea pig. Hopefully, you can derive some benefit from the trial or from the from the drug that's being tested. But really what you're doing is you're contributing to the testing of, of new tests and therapies, right? So I recruited 100 patients into our Gallium trial, and they, you know, sure, they may have derived, from, actually a lot of them derived benefit from them because I could do better surgery on them. But some of them just did it because they wanted to know, and some of them just did it because they wanted to, um, you know, help advance the technology. So that was very helpful. And in some cases, it helps us understand the disease. So there are some registry trials and some uh, follow-up trials in which we can find out how the patients are doing over time. You know, because when you look at the curves, you see it's progression-free survival. So that may be, okay, well, maybe you progress three months, but maybe you can still live many years afterwards, right? So there's still a lot of information that can, that can be, that can be um, elicited from just being part of a clinical trial. And then, uh, you know, you develop these inclusion-exclusion criteria, so who qualifies and who doesn't qualify. So, for example, in, in the, uh, the radiant trials, they actually excluded people who had genetic part components of the disease, so like this MEN. Well, that would be something that maybe we should investigate. I just don't know. So it's something in important there. Now, it's not perfect, right? It is a lot of work. You know, they, they, they're the reason that you're so well cared for when you're in a clinical trial is because we're following you so much. But that means you've got some nurse calling you like once a week to make sure you show up to your appointment or you write your logs or you keep up with it. So there's, there's a fair amount of work to do. Um, frequently you have to take patient logs, you know, for example, how many times are you, in our case, you know, how many times are you having diarrhea, for example, <coughs> for a carcinoid syndrome? Maybe in your case it would be how often do you have wheezing or something or how often are you short of breath or something. So that, there's something there. It's pretty frequent visits, you know, um, you know, I think most of you like to see me maybe once or twice a year, but not more than that, despite the fact that I think I'm charming, but I don't know if that's really true. <clears throat> but you, but you, if you're part of a clinical trial, you'll have to see the, your doc probably every two weeks or a, or a month, or in some cases even every week. Um, so there's definitely more intense investigation involved. And sometimes it involves an invasive procedure as well. So you may have to have a biopsy, or you may have to have more skin, or you may have to have something else. So there's definitely work involved for all of us. But that's really the reason um, why we need your help is because we need to learn more. So some of the resources you can take a look at, there's actually a pretty good one, the, the North American Neuroendocrine Tumor Society, nanets.net, has a pretty good site that stays up with a lot of the clinical trials. And of course, you can always go to clinicaltrials.gov. It's the um, federal government's um, log and a, a catalog of all the clinical trials going on. If you do a clinical trial, by law, you are required to register at clinicaltrials.gov. So even when I did my gallium trial, I had to go on there and, and, and register so people could read it.
and that's just really important. One thing you should know, though, not all of those trials are American, so a lot of those may be in Europe, like the one that Dr. Ober showed you, so you may not have access to it locally, but just be aware. Okay, so that's kind of what clinical trials are. That's kind of, you know, my feeling as to why we should all participate in them, and, and here's clinicaltrials.gov. So you can see here, it gives you a, a pretty good catalog of the various trials that are available, and it tells you if it's already completed, so sometimes it can be a little bit disappointing because it looks like you get, you may get 200 results, but 197 of them may be completed already, so it may not be available. But it's still a great access. So the one, the one definite trial that you have dedicated to you guys is this SPIMET trial. Um, this is this is the use of lanreotide, which is a somatostatin analog like sanostatin. It's called somatulin, um, and specifically they're looking at lung neuronectin. So the so the trial is um, this somatulin autogel or depot. It's 120 milligrams, which is the registered standard dose in, in digestive neuronectin tumors versus placebo in patients who have specifically lung neuronectin tumors, looking for efficacy and safety. It's mostly efficacy. I think everyone's pretty safe with it. And it's a, it's a good trial because it's dedicated to lung, much as Radiant 4 was kind of dedicated to lung and, and non-functional GI carcinoids. Um, really, the information we got was, was for lung. That's great. And this one is really just for you guys. And so the inclusion criteria is you have to have metastatic or unresectable disease because right, the first therapy should always be, what? The first therapy for neuroendocrine should always be surgery, right? And the second therapy should always be, right? And the third therapy should always be, Excellent, what a teachable group, I love this. <clears throat> so we always wanna get it out whenever you can, right? And so they're looking at typical or atypical neuroendocrine tumors of the lung, so nothing too angry. Um, obviously, you need to have a, a histologic diagnosis, so you have to have a biopsy-proven diagnosis, you can't just have symptoms. Um, you wanna have the mitotic index, so we learned from Dr. Ryan, of a, of a relatively well-behaved, either less than two or less than 10 for your tumors. You have to have some measurable disease, because if you have no measurable disease, they can't tell if it's working or not. And then in this part of this trial, they, they want you to have a somatostatin receptor positive imaging. So that means you either have to have a positive octria scan or a positive gallium scan. Their rationale is, well, look, we have a hormone that treats the receptor, so you should have the receptor to make it more, hopefully more effective. Um, unfortunately, sometimes in neuroendocrine tumors of the lung, specifically, the, the octreotide scan is either too weak and doesn't catch it, or a lot of neuroendocrine tumors of the lung don't have somatostatin receptor. In fact, I've tried to roll a couple of people, and, and their octreotide scans were negative, so I couldn't get them in. So that's un, uh, you know just the, one of the criteria. And then, of course, the exclusion criteria is what you would expect. Anyone who has a high-grade tumor, because the drug is probably just too weak for high-grade tumors. Um, anyone's been treated recently with a somatostatin analog, so you know it wouldn't make any sense if you were doing fine on Sando to switch you over to somatostatin. That you're doing okay. Um, if you, if anyone who's had PRT, right, and you don't want to have PRT because that's a that's a long-term therapy therapy. So why would you go on to this trial when you're actually doing pretty great? And then how would you figure it out? Is it the is it the ther the experimental therapy or is it the PRT? And of course, anyone who's been treated for um, with you know, basically a whole bunch of different hard chemotherapies that have really hurt them in recently, because then you can't make that the difference. So I'm, I'm really excited by it. This trial is open um, across the country. Uh, we have it open in Denver, it's open down in New Orleans, and, and we're very fortunate. I'm part of something called the US Oncology Network. So I can actually open this trial in about two weeks all across the country at any of our sites. So it's, uh, they've been very, very supportive of it. So it, and they just opened just a, a couple months ago, so they're still looking for patients to, to, to get on it. So if you think you might qualify, let, let your doc know or let me know. Okay, so after that, then the list becomes pretty short, and the, as you can see, the font becomes pretty small. And that was really only because I had to get all these words in here. So the first trial that's still kind, kind of ongoing, I guess you can't really be a part of it, is only if it's the, like the extension trial of Radiant 4. So if you were on the Radiant 4 trial and you had some benefit or you rolled over or, or they were, are falling for long term, you can um, do that, but you can't start it. You can't start it uh, uh, newly. Um, uh, there's, a, there's some things called basket trials as well too. So for example, if you have specific genetic mutations, they'll take you whatever, whatever tumor type you have. So for example, if you have something called like a, a, a NTRK or OS or ALK gene, then you can be eligible for that. They don't care if you're neuroendocrine. They just want to know about your mutation. 
so that's called a basket trial. And then there's some other uh, drugs out, and this is this is for all neuron, and this is not just for you, right? Uh, you can see there's YF-476 for specifically for stomach neuroendocrine tumors. There's a trial that's open now. Um, actually, it's open at our place. It's called, um, it's uh, looking at a drug called Cavazatinib, looking specifically at uh, neuroendocrine tumors, the pancreas and other carcinoid tumors. So that actually would work for you all. Uh, there's a drug uh, that's being tested down in Houston called LEE011, specifically looking at neuroendocrine tumors of the foregut. So you guys qualify for that too. Um, combination um, of, of uh, targeted radio, radiotherapy, so that's essentially PRT for neuroendocrine tumors, that's at the University of Iowa. Um, Dr. Strasberg in Moffitt has a trial looking at ibrutinib in carcinoids and neuroendocrine tumors. I think that might be digestible, only, I'm not sure. And then Dr. Reedy and Dr. Weber in New York at um, Memorial Sloan Kettering. They have a next generation of PRT, which is actually really very interesting. It's called JR11. So they're doing imaging as well as lutetium therapeutics uh, to see if they can help people with neurodegenerative tumors. I don't think there's a cutoff for um, lung or anything like that. So it, as long as your, your diagnostic test is positive, then you would qualify for the therapy. And that just opened a few months ago. So I think they're just kind of getting going. And then there's another drug called uh, Nintentinib. Um, which is being used for neuroendocrine tumors. And then uh, also this uh, kind of extension study for um, lent land reotide called Clarinet Forte. So those are the ones that are available in the United States. Uh, there are other trials that I looked up to which were, which were available in um, Europe, but you know, they're just harder to get to. Uh, it, you know, other than PRT, I think those, those were very, very similar to the kind of things we do. Maybe some combinations and, and stuff like that. Um, so there are, more trials that kind of go on, which I've, I think kind of reached, which are getting either in development or, or not quite, um, not quite uh, what's the word, kind of widespread or, or highly recruiting. <coughs> but you can see here, there's a, there's a, there's a drug called SNX5422 plus uh, Everolimus. It's a, is that a Novartis drug? Is that yours? No, I'm not sure. <laughs> um, anyway, with Everolimus for neuroendocrine tumors, uh, the group at Iowa is looking at uh, Y90, so Yttrium 90 uh, PRRT in, in combination with their gallium. Uh, I think it's a relatively small trial. It's mostly for children, so I don't think it's really for, for most of us. Um, there is a, a trial looking at Cape Cytobine, Temozolomide, plus Bevacizumab, so Dr. Uh, Oberg's uh, combination for pancreas. Uh, uh, there's a there's a trial which has been pretty slow, unfortunately, looking specifically at Everolimus and pancreatic neurotrophic tumors, and um, people who've been resected in their liver, so who've been debulked from the liver to see how fast they recur and see if it helps. It's been a little bit slow to, to come on. You can see there are a bunch of actually new drugs which are kind of being investigated. So there's a uh, there's these things called VEGF inhibitors and and platelet derived growth factor uh, dual kinases, so they can be fancier and fancier. Uh, it's a little bit like having a VCR and a DVD player in one uh, with Everolimus for treating these tumors. So, so that's actually very encouraging. Uh, there is a trial looking at another drug called Pazopanib, which is also something called a tyrosine kinase inhibitor plus temozolomide. So there's slowly, you can slowly start to see some of these things that are um, newer agents that are coming along. Most of them I can't even pronounce. And I, I read this slide a couple of times. But you can see that there are a couple things that are available. And the whole idea, oh, one actually I should mention it because it's open at, in New Orleans, is um, the compassionate use of uh, radioactive MIBG. So we've been talking about um, SSTR and the somatostatin receptor a lot for Sando and for somatuline and for PRT. But uh, we forget sometimes these neuroendocrine tumors, they have a specific pathway that process um, this molecule called MIBG. And MIBG comes as a scan which is normally used for pheochromocytomas, which is a tumor that usually causes hypertension and usually comes from the adrenal glands. But sometimes neuroendocrine tumors express, uh, I mean, uh, take up this MIBG. So if you give enough of this at a radioactive form, you can actually um, make it a therapeutic. So a lot like PRRT, there's this radioactive MIBG. And um, Dr. Ramirez and Dr. Waltering have been doing this for several years now and have seen some, some good results. Uh, it's not widespread, and it's not nearly going to be as widespread as the PR, RPRT will be, but it's something that's certainly um, available and uh, effective in certain neurodegenerative tumors. 
So just uh, some of the trials that are available for testing and imaging, which is still probably a little less exciting, but, um, but are going on and we learn a lot from it. There's um, the register net, so anyone who may have had the REN test or the NET test, uh, it's a blood test looking at, at, uh, P at, uh, um, at DNA and RNA inside the blood to help us uh, understand their endocrine tumors. They're, they're doing a testing, a big test on that. Um, uh, in Canada, they're doing the NetSeq program, which is they're profiling net neuroendocrine tumors and trying to understand them from a molecular perspective. People are looking at uh, MIBG, like I mentioned to you. I just put this up here. This trial is closed, but that's my trial there, that clinical trials one, the 68 Dota tape PET scan. That's finished now, thankfully. It was a pain in the barrier to do by myself, but it was great. Uh, had some great collaborators. Um, but then people are collecting blood. People are looking at novel therapies. People are looking at molecular analyses. Uh, people are comparing uh, different types of PET scans. Um, at the NIH, there's a natural history, which actually I think some of you are enrolled in. Um, people are looking at different types of, of gallium scanning. And people are even looking to see if mutational therapies can help predict which is the best therapy, say, Affinitor versus Sutent for the treatment of neurodegenerative tumors. Tends to be mostly for the gut, but, um, but certainly might be available to you, to you all. So you can see there's, there's quite a, a lot of interest. I mean, certainly compared to when Dr. Oberg started practicing, you know, he, he told me the story that he first saw that his first neuroendocrine case in 1977. Yeah, so, you know, back then, I don't, the word neuroendocrine didn't even exist, really, right? And so we've come a long, long ways. And actually, I'm very, very encouraged personally because since I've joined the group here in Denver, I've realized that you don't necessarily have to work at a university to really to do really interesting research. I went down to Phoenix to visit um, a group that works with the U.S. Oncology Network called TGen, and they're a company that's really interested in translational work, so so, so translational genetics, which so is what it, what it was. But um, when I got down there and I met with this very famous medical oncologist, his name is Dr. Um, Dan Van Hoff, and I said, you know, I specialize in neuroendocrine. He says, oh. I think neuroendocrine is so interesting. We see seven molecules a week, and I think a lot of them might work for neuroendocrine. So we're gonna hopefully start collaborating in where I can send the tissue and we can develop new protocols and hopefully we can get some of these new molecules out towards you because it doesn't help if they sit on the, someone's shelf. It doesn't help if it's being injected into a mouse. It only helps if we get it out there, test it rigorously, to really you know, determine if it's effective and get it out to you all because only then is it, you know, is it anything worthwhile. You know, because I know for sure that Dr. Oberg, I mean, I've read a lot of papers on Dr. Oberg's work with the virus for like the past 10 years. But for the past 10 years, it's only helped mice. So now hopefully, we'll be very soon, we'll be able to help you all. So just one more time, um, if you want to take a look, the nanets.net is a pretty good website for clinical trials. And of course, take a look at clinicaltrials.gov. And uh, that's pretty much it, I think. Yeah, that's all I have. All right, good. So sorry, that's... It's probably one of the most boring lectures I will ever give, personally. Um, but I, uh, the, the one thing I should say more importantly is that lecture was supposed to be given by my partner, Al Cohn. But Al Cohn is in the mountains right now. <laughs> and I'm so jealous. We should have had this conference in the mountains. Is there a, do you want to say something? Next year in the mountains. All right, that sounds good. Okay. <laughs> so, Freebie. These are out on the table. Uh, it's a guide from InterScience Institute, uh, comp comprehensive guide to the diagnosis and treatment of neuroendocrine tumors. They sent us 30 copies, so if you folks want to take them, they're, I don't want to fly them back to New York, so you get to keep the rest of them. But uh, yeah, the, these are terrific. Uh, love to have you uh, join the Inspire uh, website. There's a, there's a flyer outside. And we don't talk too much about uh, fundraising, all you guys who are leaving. 